Sequels, humanity's way of clinging to familiarity because we fear change in things we don't know or understand. When threatened with new ideas and experiences, we like to retreat to our comfortable little bubbles, filled with things that make us feel all warm and fuzzy inside and help us remain ignorant to the world beyond. And when those things start to get stale, we always rely on a sequel to top us up with more of the same. But sometimes that can backfire. You see, sequels can go one of two ways. They either remain faithful to their predecessor and improve upon its weaknesses, or they take a big hot steamy shit on their predecessor and go in a completely different direction. One of my favourite sequels is Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back, and thankfully it falls into the former category. Whenever I think about this game, only good things come to mind. It seems flawless. That might be my childhood nostalgia and bias talking, but I can only think about how great this game is, especially when compared to its predecessor. It feels like the perfect sequel. But I know better than that. I know better than to make such a bold claim without doing a bit of research first. So that's what I'm setting out to do. Today, I'm going to find out if Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back is the perfect sequel. To answer this question, we need to take a quick look at the original Crash Bandicoot. I've already covered the game in a video, so I recommend you check that out for my full thoughts, but here's a quick recap. The game is overall great, with beautiful visuals and music, and fun and simple gameplay, but it's held back by a handful of things. While the gameplay's simplicity is mostly a good thing, it does lead to the game feeling more repetitive the longer you play it, since it really is just run, jump and spin. Crash's movement is a little stiff as well. The plot is decent, but a little shallow, and the boss fights are pretty lacklustre. The game also has some outdated and inconvenient mechanics such as dying, cancelling out gems, and the game's save system. Overall, Crash Bandicoot is a great game, it just has a few things wrong with it that drag the experience down a little. For Crash 2 to be a perfect sequel, it needs to not only fix those mistakes, but also improve the positives. It needs to build upon Crash Bandicoot's solid foundation and iron out the kinks to be an immaculate, enjoyable experience. Let's see if Crash 2 can pull it off. The game kicks off with a cutscene that sets up the story. After his previous defeat, Cortex stumbles upon the Master Crystal, which he intends to use to power the Cortex Vortex, a device up in space capable of brainwashing everyone on Earth. However, to generate enough power, he also requires the 25 Slave Crystals scattered across the planet's surface. Since he doesn't have any henchmen left on the ground, Cortex enlists the aid of his arch nemesis, Crash Bandicoot, by abducting him and tricking him into believing that he wants to save the world. The classic man in a white van approach. It's a pretty good setup. It does a good job of telling you exactly what's going on while keeping it short and sweet so you can dive straight into the action. Overall, I think Crash 2 handles the story better than the first game. It's not a primary school sports day to the Olympics kind of improvement, but it is better. The story is generally more interesting. The stakes are higher since it's gone from save the girlfriend to save everyone on Earth, which I prefer. But what Crash 2 does that the first game lacked is development. I called the first game story a nothing sandwich because there was a beginning and an ending, but bugger all in the middle. The story in Crash 2 actually develops throughout the game. Granted, it isn't much, just a handful of short monologues here and there, but it gives the characters more life, adds to what's going on, and takes the story up from a nothing sandwich to a ham and cheese. The only thing I don't really like about the story is the way it sort of spoils itself. Throughout the whole game, Cortex is pretending to be the good guy and saying that Embryo is the true villain and all that, while Coco is slowly unravelling the truth about what Cortex is really up to, even though her laptop's battery died, so unless she got off her lazy ass and got another one herself, I don't really know how she's doing that, but that's not important. The point is, there's nothing wrong with how the game tells the story, but it's ruined by the opening. We can tell from the opening cutscene that Cortex is up to something. The game is even called Cortex Strikes Back. We know from the very beginning that Cortex is trying to deceive us. It's pretty blatant. I'm not asking for a deep, convoluted, well-written story with unexpected plot twists the likes of which no one has ever seen. I just feel like they should have made it a bit less obvious that Crash is being deceived. Beyond that, the story is as good as it needs to be. It's secondary anyway. The gameplay is more important, so let's start diving into that sweet, juicy bandicoot. You know what? I've decided not to finish that sentence. Let's just start talking about the gameplay. It's no secret that Crash 2 has phenomenal gameplay, and while it may not seem like it at first, it's a massive improvement over the first game. The main goal of the game is to traverse 3D linear levels in search of crystals, which are supposedly well hidden, but are actually just hovering in plain sight. Achieving this involves traversing these levels, breaking crates, defeating enemies, and avoiding hazards as you go. And in order for this to be fun, Crash needs to control well. 
In the original game, Crash controlled decently well, but he wasn't perfect. He was a little bit stiff and would occasionally slip around somewhat. He also had a very limited set of moves with only running, jumping and spinning being available to him, which was fine, but it did end up feeling slightly repetitive towards the end of the game. Crash 2 remedies this by tightening up his movement and giving him a few more tools to work with. It's kind of amazing how much better he feels in Crash 2. He's smoother, he's more responsive, and he's obedient. He doesn't go anywhere you don't tell him to go. And his new moves make the gameplay so much more enjoyable. The crouch, slide, slide jump, and belly slam allow the levels to be designed in a more interesting way. There are enemies that can only be defeated with a slide, crates that can only be broken with a belly slam. It's just a general upgrade from the very basic and somewhat repetitive platforming from the first game. I actually just want to hone in on how effectively Crash 2 dealt with the repetitiveness issue of its predecessor. The reason the gameplay in the first game was so repetitive was because the standard gameplay was extremely simple and the game very rarely attempted to shake things up. There was the occasional chase, hog ride and darkness level, but they didn't appear very frequently. In fact, two of them were secret levels that most players would miss entirely, so it was kind of just the same thing over and over. Crash 2 fixes this by adding some more twists to the gameplay. The chase, darkness and animal riding levels return, with more of them this time, and then there are the jetboard and jetpackers vehicles that appear every so often as well. There are also some minor gimmicks that you come across in regular levels like ice physics in the snow levels, monkey bars in the sewer levels and burrowing underground in those B levels. I will say that the ice physics are unnecessarily heavy but they're not awful. Some levels even combine these concepts, for example the level Totally Bear combines riding polar with darkness, and the level Unbearable combines the chase levels with riding polar. Crash 2 does an excellent job with handling these twists. It hits the balance perfectly. They don't appear too often to overshadow the standard gameplay, but they appear often enough to keep the gameplay feeling fresh and dynamic without getting in the way. And the best part is, they're actually fun. There are some games out there with some pretty awful gimmicks that make their gameplay the video game equivalent of waterboarding, but Crash 2 gets it right. Crash 2 also improves upon some of the peripheral gameplay elements that bugged me during the first game. The big one is the gems. To earn a gem in the first game, you need to complete a level after breaking every single one of its crates. However, if you die at any point along the way, your achievement is nullified and you aren't rewarded with a gem. This was fucking stupid. It's an unnecessary requirement that makes collecting all the gems much more of a chore than it needs to be. In Crash 2, this was thankfully changed. Dying no longer cancels out your gem. As long as each crate is broken when you reach the end, that gem is yours. The gems generally are handled a lot better in Crash 2. You have your standard clear gems which are hidden behind the breaking all crates condition, but there are some other gems that have more unique requirements. Some gems require you to reach the end of a level within a certain time limit, others require you to enter the level through a secret entrance. You've also got some pretty cheeky secrets like fake doors and fake nitro crates that you'd probably never know were fake unless you were told. You've also got death routes too, which I guess is this game's equivalent of the first game's complete the level without dying thing. These different requirements make going for 100% completion a much more interesting and fun experience, with the only exception being the level Cold Hard Crash, which can go fuck itself. What can also go fuck itself is the save system from the first game. The save system in the original Crash Bandicoot was stupid. There were only two ways to save your game. The first was by earning a gem, meaning you had to break every crate in a level without dying, and if you die, you miss the opportunity to save. The second is to complete a bonus round which you only get one attempt at. If you fail it, you miss the opportunity to save. I don't understand why the game decided to make saving your progress difficult. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Especially when the punishment for getting a game over is losing all your progress and sending you back to the last time you saved. If you're bad at the game, you might not ever get to save. That's unnecessarily brutal. Thankfully, Crash 2 did not do this. In Crash 2, you're allowed to save whenever you want and as often as you'd like. That's all the first game needed to do, but they didn't. So I'm glad Crash 2 was able to fix it by giving you a save option in the Warp Room. The Warp Room is actually one of the big changes that I feel like I should touch on. In the first game, levels were accessed through a world map. Each level was arranged in a particular order to tell the story of the game. It gave you context of where you were going, starting from the beach and working your way through the islands to reach Cortex's castle. In Crash 2, rather than a world map, we have a Warp Room. There are five Warp Rooms and a secret Warp Room, each containing five levels that you can play in any order you like. They're very different setups, but they each have different strengths and weaknesses. The world map is great for building up the world and helping tell the story, but it means that you end up with levels of similar themes grouped together. It causes a bit of a lack in diversity. The warp room is great for providing a wider variety of level themes, but doesn't do as good of a job of tying into the story. 
There's no rhyme or reason for the levels to be arranged in the way that they are, but it sort of works anyway because the whole goal of the game is to collect the crystals that are scattered across the earth. So it makes sense for the levels to be kind of random because the crystals are scattered in random locations. While I don't think the warp room is inherently better than the world map, I do prefer it. It makes accessing levels a whole lot easier, it shows you the contents of each level so you know if you found everything, and also, on a more personal note, it feels... cosy to me. It makes me feel all warm and floppy. I don't know if that's my emotional attachment to it, or if I've got some kind of undiagnosed medical condition, but I like it. There is one thing I think the original Crash game absolutely nailed. The presentation. It was brilliant. The game was vibrant and full of life, the environments were detailed and pretty, the music was a combination of catchy and atmospheric, it was undeniably spectacular. But Crash 2 somehow made it even better. Crash 2 takes the presentation of the first game and dials it up. The characters are more expressive, the environments are even more detailed and vibrant, the music is bouncier and more memorable. It's a stunning improvement, and it's, dare I say, one of the best looking and sounding games on the PlayStation. The original Crash nailed the presentation, but Crash 2 nailed it even harder. You may have noticed that a pattern has emerged. I've been overwhelmingly positive about Crash 2. Everything Crash 1 did, Crash 2 did better. Story, Crash 1 did it decently, Crash 2 did it better. Gameplay, Crash 1 did it well, Crash 2 did it better. Presentation, Crash 1 did it brilliantly, Crash 2 did it better. It seems like Crash 2 fits the bill of being the perfect sequel. At the beginning of the video, I said that in order for Crash 2 to be a perfect sequel, it needs to make an improvement on every aspect of its predecessor, and so far it seems like it has. So, what's the verdict? Is Crash Bandicoot 2 a perfect sequel? It's so close. But no. Because there is one thing that Crash 1 does better. The boss fights. Now don't get me wrong, the boss fights in the original Crash Bandicoot are pretty bad. I mean look at the fight against Papu Papu, it's trash. But even though the standards for bosses are quite low, the fights against Embryo and Cortex are actually pretty good. There's some substance to the fights in the first game. But in the second game? Christ, what happened? The fights are terrible. Engine's fight is pretty good and is probably the best boss fight in the original trilogy, but the other four are dreadful. Ripperoo's fight is a downgrade from his fight in the first game, the Komodo brothers are absolutely pathetic and pose no threat whatsoever, Tiny's fight is okay, but it's just a worse version of Ripperoo's fight from the first game, and then you have the final boss. What a fucking letdown. You go through all those levels collecting those crystals, only to finish the game on this. A short, pathetic little jetpack race in which it's impossible to die unless Cortex escapes. What a weak way to end the game, it's such a disappointment. It really is a shame because Crash Bandicoot 2 was so close to being the perfect sequel, but it unfortunately isn't. Don't get me wrong, it was a brilliant sequel and a drastic improvement over the first game. In areas story, gameplay and presentation, Crash Bandicoot 2 eclipsed the original game without a doubt. It took everything the original did well and made it even better. All the big problems I had with the first game were fixed and or improved in Crash 2, but the literal only exception is the boss fights. I really wanted to be able to say that Crash 2 was the perfect sequel, but even if I consider my childhood memories of this game and be as biased as I possibly could, there's no way that I can consider the boss fights in this game to be better than the original. They're just worse, and that's the only thing holding Crash 2 back from being a perfect sequel. But despite that, Crash Bandicoot 2 Cortex Strikes Back is an absolutely phenomenal game and an incredible sequel nonetheless. It's a must-play for all fans of platformers, and is without question one of the best platformers of all time.